I think I will uh, simply leave the floor to our distinguished uh, speaker today and uh, discuss. And uh, I am uh, very pleased to have uh, uh, Dr. Beatrice Gallelli and uh, Frieza Stephens, uh, a Max Weber Fellow in uh, Villa Schifanoia today. I'm very sorry for not being able to join you today. I'm uh, sick. <clears throat> and uh, I would just uh, like to briefly introduce uh, to you the EU Asia project that has been launched uh, in uh, uh, 2021, and uh, it has uh, the it is the first time that at the European University Institute we have been looking at not just Europe's engagement uh, with uh, um, Asia writ large, uh, but also Asia on its own merits, uh, with a specific emphasis on uh, contemporary uh, international and domestic politics. Um, and while the focus is on uh, is on Japan, we are fortunate to um, to look at the relationship with uh, uh, between you know, European uh, members, U Union member states, and uh, and important players in the so-called Indo-Pacific, including, of course, China. And we are lucky to have uh, uh, this event co-organized with the Instituto Far Internazionale today, that has run for um, uh, two years. And it's coming to its own conclusion and uh, looks at uh, the uh, relationship between Italy uh, and China by taking stock of uh, um, the uh, momentous uh, time in uh, uh, the spring of 2019 when uh, the yellow green government decided to sign memorandum of understanding uh, um, to uh, uh, embrace the uh, uh, so-called uh, Belt and Road Initiative what uh, we refer to in Italy as the Silk Road, uh, China Silk Road uh, Initiative. And uh, without further ado, uh, Beatrice will uh, present uh, a uh, paper that sums up uh, the work done at the Istituto Affari Internazionali from different vantages point. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry for being a bit uh, slow and uh, not particularly focused. I will uh, stop blabbing and leave the floor to uh, 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 Friso and uh, Beatrice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Julia, for that uh, introduction. Um, I would like to introduce our uh, speaker, Beatrice Galelli. She is a researcher at the, I hope I pronounced this uh, correctly, Institu Instituto Affari Internazionali, <laughs> where, thank you, thank you. Uh, where she works on projects pertaining to Asia and specifically uh, Chinese foreign policy, Italy-China relations, and uh, Europe-China relations. Uh, Beatrice teaches uh, Chinese language and translation at Cha Foscari Univers University in Venice and sociology of Asian countries at Alma Mater Studiorum University of Bologna. She obtained her PhD cum laude uh, from Ka, Ka Foscari University in 2019, and she has been a visiting research fellow at the School of Journalism and Communication at uh, Peking University. Um, warmly welcome, thank you for coming, and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And thank you very much, Frieza, for the hospitality, for the welcome. Um, I'm very happy to be here today in this wonderful environment. Um, OK, uh, so shall I show the screen? I'll do it by myself. OK. Um, all right. So uh, the talk, um, the, um, the research I'm going to present today, as Julio mentioned, um, started from the, uh, the, Belt and, the um, Italy signing of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, Italy signing of the Memorandum of Understanding. How can I, uh, could you help me please? Like, okay. okay. Um, okay, so uh, here there's an outline of my uh, of my presentation. Um, today I'm going to give you an overview of the entire research that has been carried out over the past two years by the um, Istituto Affari Internazionali, International Affairs Institute, 
Institute. Um, so I'm going to introduce the topic, uh, the reason behind this research. So why they started this kind of research, uh, how it has been carried out, and the the results. Um, I will uh, talking about the results. I will focus mainly uh, on a few results which I think they are particularly interested, given uh, due to the time limit of uh, today's presentation. Um, all right. So uh, to start with a memorandum of understanding, uh, we know that uh, in uh, March 20, uh, 2019, uh, during a state visit of the current president Xi Jinping in Rome, um, the Italian government and uh, the Chinese government, the, the government of the People's Republic of China, signed a memorandum of understanding um, on cooperation within the framework of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st century maritime Silk Road. So usually it is called the Memorandum of Understanding and in this occasion, a few agreements uh, were also signed, a few agreements of cooperation in various fields were, um, were signed. Uh, by signing this official Memorandum of Understanding, Italy uh, officially embraced the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So the Belt and Road Initiative, as most of you already know, was uh, um, is um, a, a quite huge project launched by the current president Xi Jinping in 2013. Um, it is aimed at connecting uh, the Eurasia continents from so starting from Asia coming to um, to Europe uh, through mainly uh, two um, two roads, one by sea and one by land. So we have uh, through the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st century. 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, and it is uh, in, it includes also six corridors. So um, I will not list them uh, now. Uh, there are a few cor corridors um, within the uh, Eurasia, Eurasia continent, and uh, usually it is uh, thought to be um, an initiative uh, focusing specifically or specifically on infrastructures, so ports on. Uh, railways uh, and so on, but actually it is much more than that. It is um, uh, a comprehensive project including various fields um, and uh, talking specifically about the Belt and Road from the point of view of Chinese politics, we should also mention that it's a quite strong political significance within China. Um, it is in this, the concept of the Belt and Road Initiative of building uh, one belt, one road, so to speak, uh, is included in the, the so-called Xi Jinping thought on socialism with the Chinese characteristics, which is a um, Xi Jinping signature ideological contributor contribution to the uh, to the cause of sinization of Marxism, which has been uh, enshrined in uh, into the uh, party's constitution as well as the country's constitution. So, um, Italy was and still is the only uh, G7 country joining officially joining. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, and it happened at the time when China-US relations were worsening, uh, to use an euphemism. <laughs> um, it was also a sensitive time for, uh, for Europe uh, because uh, the, uh, on the same day, on the same month when uh, the, the memorandum was signed, uh, the European Council was about to, to uh, to plan a meeting on a, um, for um, a EU China policy to establish a EU China policy. So a, a China policy which uh, included the, which was for all the Europe, European country. Um, sorry. Uh, so why embarking on this? project in 2019 well the uh, the reason of course uh, is linked to the huge debate 
that followed the, the signing of the memorandum. Um, it was uh, this Italy signing this uh, and the official endorsing and officially joining the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, harshly criticized by uh, a few European member states, but also from, uh, from Washington. Uh, and also the debate, uh, there was also a harsh debate within Italy's borders. So the Italy was uh, somehow represented as a Trojan horse, um, as active, uh, acting naively, uh, and the, the memorandum itself was conceived as being the product of a populist government, uh, and it was uh, going to threaten uh, both Italy's national security as well as the, nation, the, the security of the, the so-called um, West. Um, so the, um, the, the Italy was accused of um, of being overlooking that China, through the Belt and Road Initiative, was, was also pursuing its own interest. Um, and that Chinese investments in Italian infrastructure will carry risks. For, for Italy as a whole, as well as for the entire European Union. Um, so on the other side, of course, the, uh, those who sustained and supported um, the, uh, the signing of the memorandum and the, the Italy's embracing the, the Belt and Road were, were a, thought that it was a good opportunity to, uh, to get access to Chinese market and to receive, of course, Chinese capitals. So the, the question that, led, that has led the, uh, the research of the two years is, has the memorandum of understanding resulted in having such opportunity or a very serious strategic threat. In light of the polarized view uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative in general and on uh, the Memorandum of Understanding in particular, the International Affairs Institute carried out a two-year-long project which is called When Italy Embraces China's Belt and Road Initiative and aimed at understanding whether the signing of the memorandum has, um, has brought new economic opportunities as wished by uh, the Italian government at the time um, or has uh, materialized the concerns of uh, US and other European member states who fiercely criticized it. To answer this question, the, um, the research has focused mainly on five fields of cooperation. Uh, these fields of cooperation are included within the Memorandum of Understanding, um, and these are infrastructures, mainly ports, uh, finance, cooperation in the financial uh, field, um, cooperation in the field of uh, research on science and technology, uh, collaboration between Chinese media and Italian counterparts, as well as cooperation in higher education and the academia. Um, for each of these fields, uh, a mixed method research uh, was used, uh, including interviews, analysis of official documents, as well as uh, those, uh, the text of the agreements we, that are available. Unfortunately, not all the agreements are um, available. So I, here I use a graph to sum up the results. Uh, so, um, we, starting from the debate uh, uh, that the Memorandum of Understanding uh, has triggered uh, and starting from the risks that were pointed out during the debate, uh, each of the, uh, of the uh, research, I mean, uh, each of the analysis of these, uh, of the corporations uh, in the five fields were aimed at understanding whether uh, the risks uh, pointed out in the debate were real, it is actual, or unsubstantiated. And it is interesting to know that, to note that um, most of the risk 
risks pointed out in the debate around the Memorandum of Understanding uh, and uh, against the Belt and Road Initiative at large turned out to be unsubstantiated, while others, which were mostly ignored by the debate, were indeed found out during the research. So to start with, perhaps the most often cited uh, risk uh, that um, in, the, in Europe, but also in other countries, in other Asian countries also uh, is mentioned about when dealing with, uh, uh, when talking about the Belt and Road Initiative is the so-called debt trap. That is according to which um, China, provi China provides loans impossible to be, re uh, to be repaired by recipient nation with the ultimate goal of taking control of co-financed infrastructures. Previous research uh, has already demonstrated that the narrative of the debt trap is based on a wrong assessment of China's advantage and the damage suffered by the recipient countries. In addition, recipient countries are assumed to be passive and credulous victims that blindly accept Chinese loans like the, usually the agency of the recipient country is not even mentioned or taken into account. Um, while China is framed as a conniving creditor, slightly forcing other countries to accept Chinese capital for its own sake. So, and also the, usually the, um, the argument go, do not uh, take into account the fact that these uh, debt traps may cause troubles also to China, not merely, not merely to the recipient countries. Um, in reality, things are quite, uh, quite more complicated and China prefers to renegotiate loans rather than signing ownership or, or control of the assets it has invested in. The, uh, so the debt trap was not a real risk, uh, an actual risk in the Italian case. Um, and in specifically also because uh, the, uh, the Italy has a legal framework that prevents such kind of risk. And somehow linked to the debt trap is the, uh, the second most often uh, quoted the risk when, when dealing with the Belt and Road, which is that China takes control of the connectivity lines and hubs by financing their, uh, their development. Uh, so, following this, this concern was especially the experience of the port of Piraeus in Greece, which is a majority owned by China Costco Shipping, one of the largest container ship companies in the world. However, the Piraeus represents an exception rather than a rule, at least in the European Union, because it is the only case in which Chinese investments were aimed at acquiring direct control of the, of, of the port authority and not over individual terminals. The agreements between the Italian ports of Genoa and Trieste, the only two ports which were included in the Memorandum of Understanding signed in 2019, um, and the Chinese state-owned enterprise, China Communication Construction Company, CCCC, cannot lead, this, cannot lead to the acquisition of a total control by this latter, by the Chinese China Communication Construction Company, to take control of, over the two, of the two hubs. This is for mainly for two reasons. First of all, according to Italian uh, to Italy's law, investment in public infrastructures such as ports must go through tender procedures and the Chin and Chinese companies have so far failed to win contracts. Second, ports cannot be sold in Italy. So um, they never, they can never be sold, but they can only be leased to companies. And even in the case of lease, can, this lease can be revoked for commercial or, or security reasons. Another major uh, concern 
pertaining to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is that the Belt and Road um, in general solely plays to China's advantage without bringing benefits to the other, other countries. Um, a, a good example of this um, of this uh, of this concern and the usually uh, an argument on which this concern is based is that Chinese companies bring their own workers, so bring Chinese workers, uh, so they do not even uh, offer uh, opportunities in terms of jobs. Um, however, again, this not this does not this does not oh, sorry this does not, not apply to the Italian ports of Genoa and Trieste. And besides, the building of a new terminal at the Vado Ligure port, which was not included in the memorandum of understanding, was con was conditioned on the employing on employing local forces, and the thus brought economic opportunities and uh, to the surrounding area. Now let's turn towards the risks that are actually that are actual. First of all, we have the transfer of sensitive, sensitive technology and know-how. Uh, this transfer transfer may happen in two ways, mainly in two ways. The first one is through the establishment of research and development centers in Italy or the other forms of partnership with uh, Italian counterparts. And second, through the acquisition by Chinese companies of Italian firms that, that all, they'd have high value patents or, or that conducted the research and development activities in strategic sector. sector. So the, for instance, the recent case of the drone sold by Alpi Aviation uh, was a case in point, is a case in point. Um, however, as Francesca Giretti has highlighted in her interview, which was posted also, which was mentioned um, uh, in, uh, on uh, news coverage, um, the EU framework for foreign direct investment uh, at the time was not in place, was not operational. So, uh, and also we will talk, uh, perhaps we will talk a little bit more about it later, but there's another issue which has to do with uh, the uh, screening mechanism, that is if uh, the uh, EU member state doesn't know about the acquisition, the EU, there's little, there's little can do. Another major issue and actual risk that has come up with the research uh, that the, the research has demonstrated that uh, especially the cooperation in the field of media uh, carries the danger of spreading China's propaganda. Um, indeed, um, among the agreements signed during Xi Jinping's state's visit, there were also, there were also those we, between um, RAI, Radio Televisione Italiana, which is Italy's national broadcaster company, and the China Media Group, China's conglomerate of state region television broca broadcasters. And the other one between ANSA, Agenzia Nazionale Stampa Associata, which is Italy's main news agency, and Xinhua. Uh, which is PS's official state-run present agency, respectively. Now, the problem is that uh, arises because also here we have uh, an agreement between two um, media uh, outlets, which have a completely different view of uh, the role of the media in society. Um, because we, we know that like in China, in the People's Republic of China, uh, especially since the 1990s, media are meant to guide public opinion while we know that in Italy and also in other European countries, as well in the, as in the US, uh, media are viewed as a source of information, but also a watchdog or a scrutinizer towards the, um, the who uh, has power 
within the country. So these agreements arise a number of issues. The, mo the most important one is the spreading of propaganda, as I said, and um, and this is mainly, I, here I mentioned one, one example of the, of the way in which the propaganda is spread through collaboration. Here we have on the slide, you see, first of all, that the uh, publications, the articles published on the ANSA website since the signing of a memorandum has increased notably. Um, here's a graph showing that in 2018, there is a, it, start, it starts growing and then it, uh, it's further uh, accelerate uh, in, 20, in 2019. Um, of course, this is partially due to the fact that China uh, as, a, as a country is gaining always more attention uh, within the field of media also in Italy. Uh, but it is also it we may infer also that it is somehow linked to the to the agreement. But um, the main issue is the way in which uh, the collaboration um, is um, is meant. That is uh, to uh, in accordance to the agreement. So Xinhua news cover, coverage of China is also published in, uh, in Italian or directly on, uh, on the ANSA website. And usually Xinhua takes, takes care of the translation. So the, um, the articles are translated by Xinhua and then posted on the ANSA website without going through any um, modification by the, uh, the, Italian, um, the Italian counterpart, so by uh, people working at ANSA. Um, you see in the slide, like in the screenshot, we have um, the screenshot of the ANSA webpage. Uh, we have that those articles coming from Xinhua are labeled as being from Xinhua. The problem is that usually Italians uh, who don't have uh, and uh, who are not aware of the China's media marketplace uh, do not know what Xinhua is. So perhaps they may th they may think that is a uh, uh, this. Uh, report is produced by AMSA, AMSA, while it is not. So um, this is the main, uh, one of the main issue brought about by collaboration with, uh, with uh, Italian, Italian media, with, um, collaboration between Italian media and Chinese counterparts. So now I turn towards the conclusion. Um, the results of the research has uh, highlighted that in all the fields, um, there were little economic benefits brought about by the memorandum of understanding. So the, the economic opportunities and supports that the, uh, the Italian government at the time were wish, was wishing for did not arrive. Um, but on the other hand, we also have that not all the concerns that have been point, that was that were point, pointed out during the debate following the memorandum of understanding in March 2019, not all of them have materialized, especially when it comes to uh, the concerns over um, the Italian's infrastructure or Italy's falling into the debt trap and so on. On the other side, we found that some fields of cooperation that went unnoticed at the time deserve a further attention because uh, we still have also, um, also recently, uh, this kind of problem, the one that I just mentioned, like uh, a publication by ANSA of uh, news coming from, uh, of news coming from Xinhua.
Um, so here I listed the, uh, the papers which are available on, on the website of the International Affairs Institute. Um, and they go deeper into, uh, into the analysis. Um, and that's all. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Beatrice, for this uh, very interesting uh, talk on um, Italy-China relations and, um, well, the context of, uh, of the European Union's relationship with, uh, with China. Um, so I'm going to ask you uh, two, two questions, and then I'm going to open the uh, floor up for, um, uh, for the audience. So please, if you have any questions, just um, uh, type it in the, in the chat. Uh, or uh, raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll uh, give you the turn. Um, yeah, so you mentioned in the talk that um, uh, what was in the, in the news recently about the uh, uh, Chinese purchase of an Italian drone company. And you said that uh, when the EU doesn't know uh, about this acquisition, it, it can't do much. Um, which uh, reminded me of um, the uh, inequality of arms, so to say, between small and medium sized companies in Europe and the uh, narrow self-interest of its uh, shareholders versus the um, party state in China, which uh, has a, a coordinated uh, plan. Um, not uh, in a hierarchical sense, but um, its companies um, have to uh, follow the um, um, well the country's uh, aims. Uh, how do you see that, and what can we do to level the playing field? So uh, you're going to to tell me also the second question or? Sure, sure. No, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, Sure. Um, yeah, so the second question um, um, relates to the uh, effectiveness of the uh, screening mechanism. Um, and um, yeah, because the uh, drone purchase was uh, before that, um, but has it been uh, effective in general? Has the research shown that? or does it need uh, amending? Mm. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, of course, these two, these two questions um, pertain also to the way China, uh, to the way the government of China uh, um, handle the economic field. There is a main difference, uh, I think, uh, between the way in which um, the, the relations between the political and the economic field in China and the one uh, in Italy as well as in, um, in Europe. Um, of course, talking about the lack of re reciprocity and the, the way in which the European countries has been trying to uh, level the playing field um, hasn't reached um, wasn't it has been it hasn't been successful so far we know that like for instance at the beginning of um at the beginning of this year was the uh the comprehensive uh agreement of investment was it this year or uh, this, year, yeah. this year um they uh, so the comprehensive agreement on investment was attempting to uh to remedy on this issue, like to establish a reciprocity between uh, each, between the access to Chinese market and to at least to gain part of the access to uh, part of the access to the to the Chinese market. But we know also that it was freezed, <laughs> and it was freezed uh, due to uh, mainly to political to political issues. Uh, it was after, um, 
after that China, China sanctioned um, uh, members of the European Parliament and also other important institutions, including also scholars and so on. Um, so this, uh, the, the lack of reciprocity and how to play, how to level the playing field has been an issue uh, for quite a long time um, recently. Um, uh, Europe has attempted to, to do some uh, improvements, but it hasn't uh, reached any result yet. Um, talking about the screening mechanisms, we know that uh, I mentioned in my talk that uh, the acquisition of those of the LP um, was before the Euro uh, European Commission uh, set the guidelines uh, on uh, the screening mechanism uh, for foreign direct investment, uh, which was um, the, the year following, if I'm not wrong. And uh, after that, um, first of all, the, the, the and, but we also need to keep in mind that, that the, the framework is not, um, uh, is not going to replace the screening mechanism set by uh, EU member states. They are meant to, um, to complement them, and they usually look at those foreign direct investment that involve at least two member states, not one, just one member state, as was the case of uh, um, the case of uh, Italy. But Italy also has uh, done a lot to improve his screening mechanism. And uh, the, the year following uh, EU um, setting up of this framework, Italy also enlarged the so-called golden power, which is a power by the government to, um, to intervene and to stop uh, uh, acquisitions by uh, foreign companies of uh, Italian companies in specific uh, and strategic uh, fields. Um, so the, the, the problem is that uh, screening, this screening mechanism, we, we, the problem is that first of all, it is in the hands of the government. So the government in power at the time and also it has to do also with the dimension perhaps of the enterprises of the companies involved. Um, another another uh, important um, point uh, to look at I think is that uh, usually uh, we also have to keep in mind that um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my answer, the relations between the economic field and the political field in China is quite different. Uh, I, and uh, for these, I, I don't want to say that all the investments by Chinese companies abroad are directly controlled by the state or the Chinese government, but, you, but usually they follow the guidelines set by the central government, which is not the case in Italy or in other European countries usually. Um, so uh, we also have, when dealing with uh, uh, such a different uh, situation, such a different country from this point of view, we also should take it to take it into account, I think. And now if I answer your yeah, question. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks so much for, for elaborating uh, on that. Uh, I do not see questions yet. Please f feel free to- um... I guess it, there's one here. Oh, apologies, yeah. Um, go ahead, please. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering whether there is any relationship between this memorandum of understanding and uh, let's say the, the very big topic, which is 5G, in which we have seen either the exclusion or, an, or restriction placed on the use of Huawei equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Italy has actually forbidden an agreement between FastWeb and Huawei 
I know that ZTE is interest in, is investing in R and D. So um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly whether if I understood correctly the scope of the mem memorandum of understanding, whether it includes science and technology, and if it does, how the Italian action on 5G, so on the exclusion of Huawei is compatible with this whole program, or in more in general, if you could, if you have done research on the relationship between China and Italy with respect to 5G. I would be very interested in that. Th thank you, thank, thank you. you. It was, it has been quite a hot topic, the 5G and Huawei working in Europe. Um, Francesca Ghiretti has done uh, quite a, a lot of research on that. And um, yeah, the, first of all, science and technology was included within the memorandum of understanding. Um, it, I must specify that the memorandum of understanding, the one I showed you in the um, in the slide, there was uh, that one was a general agreement. Uh, so um, the framework, so to speak, uh, to set up the collaboration. But then there were other um, twenty nine agreements uh, focusing specifically in uh, with a specific focus. Um, they are all available online, and uh, I mentioned them in the in the policy paper. Um, yeah, the five uh, G uh, issue. The five G issue is uh, uh, it has been stopped by the Draghi's government, not by the um, the coalition which uh, was. Uh, uh, in power at the time of the signing of the memorandum. Um, and of course, uh, um, uh, as far as I know, the uh, blocking the collaboration with Huawei was uh, um, it, the, 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 the reason behind it wasn't merely because it was a Chinese company, but it was, it was because a strategic field. So uh, the um, because always we also need to keep in mind that uh, we sh um, not uh, the, the Italian government of the time, of course, uh, was quite aware the, of the need of not uh, going uh, of applying discrimination towards um, towards Chinese companies. But it it happened uh, during the, um, Draghi's government. Thank you. We have another uh, question uh, by Etim Ophion. Um, shall I read it or would uh, you like uh, to ask it yourself? Yeah, I read. Uh, so da, uh, does Italy's involvement in the Belt and Road Initiative extend to cooperation in outer space activities? Um, if yes, how does it impact on EU space programs? Um, as far the um, the only agreement which was um, which pertained specifically to the to the construction of um, space infrastructure, may I call them, uh, was blocked. Uh, it was suspended, and again, it was by uh, it was done by the uh, Draghi's administration, Draghi's government, not by the coalition ruling at the time. Um, so I guess that the uh, answer to the uh, second question is. No, it doesn't impact on EU space programs. Um, if I uh, may, Beatrice, um, I would like to get back to the uh, reason why China, um, um, individuals in China got sanctioned by the new uh, EU sanctioning mechanism. And there was of course the, the human rights situation in China and then uh, we went from economics to, to politics, but also to uh, values, uh, liberalism versus uh, Chinese, uh, China's uh, party state system. Um, and if we um, step back a little bit, we, we also see that uh, this all plays out against the backdrop of the intensified Sino-US uh, rivalry. We, we discussed this uh, over lunch. Um, and of course, um, power and influence um, um, 
uh, is derived from economics. And uh, Xi Jinping was quoted in the New York Times as uh, saying the high tech is the sharp end of the modern state. And of course, this is in the end about high tech and sustaining a, a competitive edge um, in Europe vis-a-vis uh, uh, China. Um, how do you see this geopolitical element, this systemic environment that changed uh, in the last few years? And um, how do you view the, um, uh, the, the competitive high-tech uh, aspect of this, of this story? Um, okay, thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, the point is that, um, in my view, uh, domestic politics and foreign politics, when it comes to China in particular, are much more linked to one another as, uh, than people usually think. Um, the high tech, the, feel, the, the field of the high tech is one of uh, China's prior priority at the moment. We know that uh, already in 2017, uh, Xi Jinping set uh, three main goals to be reached. One has already been reached, which was eradicating absolute poverty. The second one is in 2035, which is uh, to transform China into the most uh, high-tech country. And the, uh, the third one is to realize the, how it is official, officially called rejuvenation of the, um, of the, of the Chinese nation, which uh, basically means to uh, have China as the most influential country on the international um, scene. Um, so of course, uh, given that it is uh, high tech is crucial to, uh, to reach uh, the goals set by the Xi Jinping's uh, administration, uh, of course it affects also China's foreign policy and China's attitude towards other countries, I think. Um, when it comes specifically to the rivalry, I think that at the, at the time of the Trump administration, Trump was the best present for Xi Jinping, the best gift by, that the United States could uh, give to China. Um, and we also, uh, the, by, we also should take, in mind, to take into account that Biden's administration, although it has changed the tones, uh, some of the uh, policies and the, some of the um, ideas and principles in uh, uh, US-China policy has not changed, at least so far. Um, the, in addition, when talking about uh, specifically the high tech, we should also bear in mind that uh, high tech is also crucial for the economic transformation of Chinese society. Um, Chinese society is changing at the moment. Uh, its um, economic growth uh, cannot, uh, can no longer be merely based on exports of uh, labor intensive goods, but uh, it is changing towards um, high valued products and, um, and so on. It is, uh, uh, China is trying to arrive to reach a post-industrial uh, kind of uh, economic development. This does not mean that um, labor intensive production is no longer uh, one considered within uh, China's academic, economic um, uh, growth or by uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese government, it means that they are trying to develop also um, high value, uh, the production of high value products. And they are also like moving physically the factories, uh, labor intensive factories, and also uh, and it, 
and this movement of factories has to do also with the reason why um, the EU freezed uh, the comprehensive agreement of investment because parts of the factory were moved also to uh, western regions of the People's Republic of China and I meant Xinjiang um, where uh, the um, there is um, uh, how to say the uh, there is uh, um, it is going on uh, the construction of the so-called re-education camps and uh, where also uh, non-Han population are forced to, um, to work. Um, so uh, going back to the, uh, to the competition between the US and China, um, it is going to last for a while, I think, in terms of the competition within the high tech, uh, within the high tech. Recently, the call, uh, the video call between Biden and uh, and Xi Jinping, with uh, Xi Jinping calling Biden Biden Lao Peng Yo, like old friend, was quite uh, uh, much more relaxed than the previous one, at least <laughs> when there were, was a, quite a big fight between the two parts, uh, but. Uh, it, it, it hasn't changed, I think. And they are going to cooperate in some fields, um, like uh, the field of climate change uh, and the, the fight against, um, against climate change. But in many other fields, they, are going, they will still uh, keep the, the fight on. We have another question uh, of uh, a team of Fion. Uh, if the risk that you uh, listed are mitigated, would you encourage Italy to embrace uh, the BRI fully? Would you encourage other European countries to join? Okay, thank you for, for the question. Um... Uh, it depends on from which perspective we look at the uh, at the Belt and Road Initiative. First of all, um, as I mentioned in the conclusion, the economic um, haven that the, uh, the government, uh, the coalition was wishing for when signing the memorandum of understanding has not resulted. So there were little economic benefits actually uh, after the memorandum. Um, this may be due to the COVID-19, to the impact of the COVID-19, but also to other, uh, to other, um, to other issues. Um, I, I, I wouldn't um, encourage or not encourage other European countries to join the Belt and Road Initiative, but when we're dealing with these, uh, with these uh, project and in, in the China-led uh, project, we, we should also uh, look at the, um, at the, uh, at them from a critical perspective, trying to uh, distinguish between what are the uh, real risks, the actual risks, and what are those that were pointed out, but they are based on, they are groundless. Um, it, it means that uh, we also, the, 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 the reason behind the research was this one, was trying to understand and trying to provide data for also to the for for governments from for Italian governments as well as for other European governments in order to assess whether to keep going such kind of agreements or keep going uh, this kind of collaborations or not to try to understand and distinguish between those that are narratives and those that are actual risks that should be taken into account when establish this kind of cooperation or others uh, or other kinds. Uh, and talking specifically about the Belt and Road Initiative, which um, I didn't mention in my talk, but I pointed at a should stress is that most of the collaborations we, uh, that were included in the memorandum were set long before the 
uh, the, the 2019. So uh, actually the Belt and Road, and this is true for Italy as well as for other projects called the Belt and Road projects abroad. Most of the uh, Belt and Road projects were already there before Xi Jinping launching the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so they actually, they, this kind, the Belt and Road works as a kind of umbrella term, so to speak, placed and uh, on projects that were already there, but they, uh, and by doing so, by labeling them Belt and Road, part of the Belt and Road, they also uh, acquire kind of political significance, of course, and also um, from the point of view of China, also cohesiveness. So I, um, I'm not in the position of suggesting uh, other countries, other European countries to endorse or embrace the, the Belt and Road Initiative or suggesting them not to do so. Uh, I, I think that it depends, um, but we are, as researchers, as analysts, our goal is to uh, provide data, data and uh, facts. Uh, to which on uh, based one uh, one decision, one country's decision. Finished. <laughs> on uh, on that uh, note, uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Beatrice, for this uh, insightful talk, and thank you. I'm going to try again to pronounce this correctly. The Instituto Affari Internazionali uh, for the um, for for the for the research and the team there. Um, you did a remarkable job separating myth from reality while maintaining a critical perspective. Um, very valuable. Thank you. Also, on behalf of uh, my mentor and the organizer of this uh, uh, event, uh, Giulio Puglese. Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, that's it. Thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Also thank you. Online. Thank you very much, Fries. And thank you again, Giulio, and all the European University Institute. Thank you. Thank you.